Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hummel. And I'm your host, Sully Hummel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. Today, we watched a movie called Prevenge from 2016. Prevenge being not an actual word, implying revenge in advance. Prevenge. Yeah. Is there a word for that? I no, I I don't think Venge? so. Preemptive vengeance. You can Ooh. shorten to prevenge if you'd like. Yes, yes. I do like the word prevenge, and I do think it should be a word. Well, can I launch right into that? Because that's a whole issue go, with the movie. Go launch. Wait, do we need to tell them anything about this movie, we, or are you just going to launch? Let's launch with the premise of the film. Okay. The premise of this film is that this woman goes around killing people because she thinks her baby, uh, she's pregnant, her unborn baby, is telling her to kill these people. Yes, she hears she hears the voice of her fetus as a very articulate, <laughs> yes. high-pitched woman yeah. giving her orders. And she does them. And then also at one point she gets in uh, like a conflict with it. She doesn't want to do one of the killings. Mm. And then the baby's like making her feel sick or cramps or something. And yeah, she's like, no, I don't yeah. want to. And she has to because the baby can hurt her. Sure. It, it was in no way just the normal way her pregnancy was moving forward. Yeah. That's kind of the uh, question of the whole movie is, is she just crazy or is there, you know, an entity in her baby that can tell her what to do. Our cats are fighting. They always shoot. We, we hit record and they immediately start making noise when they are the silentest animals in the world Stealthy every other time. Cats. So now I'm going to launch. Okay, launch. The prevenge. word prevenge implies vengeance to an action that hasn't occurred yet. Yes. And yet all of these killings, and this is a spoiler because we figured this out through the movie, all of these killings are in revenge, revenge. They're just they're just normal revenge. For something that happened before the baby, well, after the baby was conceived, before the actions of the movie when the baby tells us to do this. This is true. And that bothered me. Like, I thought it would be so interesting, you know, if you think about it, like if you went through the movie, like she's seeing these visions of her husband getting killed and whatnot, and she's killing these people who are involved in it. And then we find out later, he's not dead yet. And like and he, he's ooh, only just ooh. he hasn't even gone on this this on weekend this yeah. uh what was it, mountain climbing yeah. thing at all yet. It would be really cool then if at the end, like there's the one she refuses to kill. She's like, No, I can't do it anymore. And that one ends up killing him. That would be great. <gasps> Oh, see, this movie could have been awesome. Yeah, that's that was a that was a lack of pre to their venge. So I realized that partway through the movie, I'm like, oh, this isn't pre venge at all. <laughs> it's just revenge, yeah, like normal. And then I had the thought, there's like I sort of like the play on words in the sense that we think it's the baby getting revenge. Like, mm -hmm. the mom keeps saying she doesn't want to do it, and the yeah. baby is ordering her to do it, or the fetus is ordering her to do it. So it was sort of prevenge in the sense that this fetus didn't exist as an individual entity <laughs> yet. It couldn't get revenge on its own, so it was like pre in the sense that before it was capable, it was doing this other thing. But that yeah, was me kinda. stretching. Yeah, or the pre just stands for pregnant. Pregnant venge. <laughs> Pregvenge. <laughs> I, I don't mean, know. Pregvenge is, is a little <laughs> awkward to say. It is not great. Speaking of pregvenge, though, uh -huh. uh, what I just learned this morning before going into this is the actress was actually eight months pregnant filming this movie for the entire movie. Interesting. I, You know what? There were times where I was like, that is either a pregnant lady or that is one of the most accurate representations yeah. of pregnancy I've seen. And apparently what she did was she was frustrated that she couldn't get roles while she was pregnant. So she wrote this movie in three days and then had it made some way. 
I mean, maybe that's why she didn't catch on to the fact that there was no pre to her venge. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> but it was her getting revenge on all the people who won't give her roles. Pregvenge. 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 <laughs> Honestly, I was like, there were things that were happening when she was, you know, like attacking people and whatnot, yeah. where I'm like, this pregnant lady is like, she's quick on her feet. Like she is, yeah. she is... She has some power to her, considering she is largely pregnant. And then to find out that she was pregnant while she was playing yeah. these roles, I'm like, I'm impressed. It was for reals. You know, we have this idea in TV and movies, not in real life, but we have this idea in TV and movies that pregnant ladies are fragile and, you know, they yeah. can't do things for themselves and, oh, they can't bend over. She was bent. She was doing yoga. <laughs> yes, she was doing special pregnancy yoga. Like... I mean, yeah. So she was not particularly fragile. Oh, and the baby in the movie was played by her baby and when it was 10 days old. Wow. That's pretty good timing to be able to play a pregnant lady through most of uh -huh. the movie and then play a not pregnant lady <laughs> with a baby and just like, it's all you, you know? Yeah. So here's my real confusion with this i mean i i pretty much enjoyed the the idea that this pregnant lady was going out and getting revenge on all of these not prevenge revenge <laughs> on all of these people who had killed her husband or she, she thought had killed her husband and it was pretty clear that they had had something to do with his death yes like that that there was a decision made that ended in him being dead but what what decision was made I don't know that it was explicit. I mean, explicitly, we saw that someone cut the rope. Sure. And that it was intentional. They talked about mm -hmm. that. So A I, decision was made to yeah. save the lives of the other people. I think it just had to be that they were all, you know, hanging from the same rope and it wasn't able to support them. And then you got to wonder, that was something you knew in advance. Why did you do this? So that is definitely the impression that was given. Because at one point, she goes to the, like mountain climbing training facility or whatever. And she's like, oh, you know, so it would be odd to hang seven people from this rope or whatever. Yeah. But here's where I have a problem with the whole scenario that was set up. And maybe this is because it was written in three days and there was nobody <laughs> to be like, uh, nope. In the flashbacks that she's having or the pictures that she's having, which I don't know how she, like, maybe she got this from the inquest. I don't know. Yeah. Or it's just her imagination. The guy who actually cuts the rope is the instructor. And when we're watching it be cut, he's clearly at the top of the cliff, <laughs> cut, leaning over and cutting the rope. Yeah. Uh, that seems problematic. Okay, because that's the decision to let all seven of them fall to their death. You would like, think. I don't understand how it all fit together. Yeah, that seems confusing i mean i think there's a thing you know i was making fun of them like why would you put seven people on the rope if it can't handle it but i think there's a there's a thing which i've learned by watching other movies about mountain climbing so i'm very knowledgeable because you here. know movies about mountain climbing are definitely dead on yeah uh, yeah accurate. i've learned i'm okay i'm well versed okay and what i think is the deal is that you know sometimes things happen like one of the pitons I don't even know if that's pronounced right, but it's a mountain climbing word. Pops out of the rock or something, sure. and now suddenly your rope is not as stable anymore. And then you're like, oh, no, we have to cut someone loose or it's going to all fall. That kind of thing. So it's not as dumb as put them on a rope that can't hold them. So there's right. that. I mean, I think the idea is they weren't all – they weren't supposed to be relying on the rope. They were supposed to be relying on themselves climbing down the cliff. <laughs> sure. And the rope was there for safety reasons. Yeah. And I could see how, you know, one of them falls. But here's the thing. The fact that one of them could fall, then causing a series of them to lose their grip, yeah. is why you only have one person on the rope at a time. Like, you don't all, yeah. you're not interspersed evenly along the length of the cliff. <laughs> one person goes down, and then the next person, like, that's or my like understanding. Or, like, on the cliffs of, of insanity, one person goes up with one person on them. Yes. And one person on the rope below them. Yes. I mean, and, and again, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they do that. That seems stupid to me. But there are, it's just one of the many reasons why I'm yeah. not going to be a cliff climber. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what the deal was. And, you know, I think it's just representing random mountain climbing challenges. 
But the but, problem is... Yeah, the guy at the top of the hill is yeah, weird. Yeah, it just didn't... It. The problem is she's supposed to be the character we have sympathy and empathy for, right? And Sort of, yeah. And there is an element of sympathy and empathy for her because her husband died and he didn't have to necessarily and mm-hmm. i you know and there's see all of her that. being sad and that gives you empathy right but then like the way they get us on her side is to dribble out these facts and it's like a mystery and we slowly mm-hmm. are piecing together what happened and it's supposed to be helping us i think figure out whether she's crazy <laughs> or whether she's really being possessed by it the fetus in her tummy tum tum <laughs> Um, yes, as her nurse would say. <laughs> so, like, it's dribbled out, but then when a story dribbles information out like that for you to piece together what happened, the assumption is you're going to be able to piece together what happened. And my frustration was that we didn't get... It was like they were dribbling out pieces to several different puzzles, and we're like, see? <laughs> and there was no picture to be made because the puzzle pieces didn't fit together. Yeah, I don't think they fully resolved it. I feel like the only real um, result of those puzzle pieces was like a third of the way through the movie where we go from she's just randomly killing some people. Well, I guess two. We go from she's just randomly killing people to she's killing people who were involved in her husband's death to, oh, it was he was cut off this line. And that's how that went. Right. And for, for a while, it's like, oh, she's killing people who were there when her husband died. Yeah. Not necessarily that they had anything to do with it. Yeah. And then we realized they did. There was a point where she was asking, toward the end, where she was asking the instructor who cut the rope. So maybe yeah. she didn't know. And, and the things that we were seeing were just her yeah, imagination so. of what happened. Something like that. I don't know. Because they didn't have film of it, so... No. It would have to be in her head. I mean, I feel like it would have been described at the inquest. So maybe she was yeah, picturing. Which she was present for. But again, I feel like at the inquest, they would have been required to say who had cut the rope. Right? Like, yeah. they, I don't think the, the, the legal inquest, the medical inquest involved in this suspicious death would have just let the whole group of seven people who survived <laughs> go, well, it was a group decision. <laughs> yeah. They all did it. Right? And that's why she gets to kill them all. And then the thing is, at the start of the movie, she was killing creepy dudes. And so it seemed like that's where we were going. So here's the thing. The first two people were very creepy, Mm -hmm. were very assaulty. Yeah. And even to the point where she's at that first doctor's appointment and the doctor is like, so (laughs) what does your partner do? And then looks at the notes and is like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like even through that, I was like, I was under the impression that she had been assaulted and this baby was the result of that assault. Hmm. Like, Which makes sense. Yeah. It was, and so it was kind of a like it was a little jarring then to find out that that wasn't the situation. Like it was such a distraction, yeah. and then it was like, <laughs> nope, the story's over here. Well, for me, it was when she was at the nurse. Uh, that was after her first kill of a very creepy dude. Mm-hmm. She's at the nurse, and the nurse is so obnoxious and terrible and perky. I'm like, oh. This whole movie is just going to be a series of her coming across annoying people and murdering them. <laughs> because is she's there a pregnant. plot? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just hormones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a moment where I thought that too. But sadly, she didn't kill the nurse. No, and it wasn't until the the fetus at one point says something about them cutting her, cutting her daddy down, and I was like, oh wait, what now? Yeah. The dad is someone we care about. The dad is not an evil person. So here's a metaphorical artsy thing that I noticed that maybe I am imposing on the movie, but I like to think it was a part of it. The first guy she kills runs like an exotic pet shop, right? And there's lots of lizards. And we see several shots of chameleons. Oh, okay. That's artsy. And the way this pregnant woman manages to get access to all these people and i mean they're they're sort of disarmed because she's a pregnant lady and we have this idea that pregnant yeah. ladies are weak right but each person she interacts with you see her start as herself and then as 
that person does things and says things, you kind of watch her chameleon herself mm-hmm. into exactly the person they want to interact with or exactly the person they think she is or whatever. Yeah. And so, like, I really liked that idea that, you know, they were like, ooh, here are these chameleons. And then later <laughs> she's the chameleon through the whole thing. Yeah. And I think she did that because she was she was very good at it. She would just sort of pull things out without you know, hesitating and Mm -hmm. thinking about it. She's just like, yeah, my eight-year-old wants a lizard. Right. And just jump right on that. And But it was more than just the information she said, too. It was like her body language would change and her the way she would put words together even. Like, she, you could see her start to mirror the people she was interacting with. And I thought that was fascinating character development and really good acting. Well, and, okay, so all of this sounds like quite the drama. So this is actually a dark comedy Mm -hmm. really but i didn't even realize that till like a third of the way through the movie there's some funny lines before that but it rides this really weird line where the tone of the whole movie is very dark and somber and i don't know just sad and morbid Mm -hmm. and yet it has these very goofy comedic bits in it the boxing scene when she's trying (laughs) to kill the the sporty lady like what? <laughs> and they're fun. They're well done uh-huh. because uh, most of these actors I recognize from other comedies, from other English comedies. This is a British movie. And I'm like, yeah, they're just they're, they're doing some comedy in here. And yeah. it's it's weird though because it doesn't have any comedic tone other than the comedy. It's I don't know how I mean, how to say that. It's it's really like under there and it's I mean, it's it's the kind of movie, though, that I don't think anybody who doesn't have a bit of a dark sense of humor would appreciate. Like, if yeah. you didn't have, if you couldn't laugh about this sort of thing, you, there's nothing about this movie you would enjoy. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, like, there's just nothing to it. But with that layer of ridiculousness to it, the surreal element of the whole premise. But it's just yeah. kind of like. It's it's almost like highbrow comedy because it's it's doing the jokes at the same time as it's doing this whole uh, thing where she's got this black and white movie. I forget what it was called. I saw it in the credits, mm. but it, it's the Furies are the characters in the movie. It's a movie from the 30s mm-hmm. and they're all screechy and weird and she like adopts that as her mm-hmm. thing. And like that's a whole artistic thing that feels artistic and deep and it takes the baby thing real seriously the baby telling her stuff it treats it seriously even though it's ridiculous it's also a comedy so why isn't it making that silly but it's so weird it sort of reminds me of happy only without the obvious layer of it's ridiculous like in happy he's hearing these voices and we see this cartoon creature that you know so it's it's clear like oh you know this is ridiculous in Prevenge, it's sort of the same idea, only we don't get that obvious clue. So, yeah. yeah. It's just so interesting how the tone and the comedy are apart. Speaking of comedy, no one named Josh is going to not tell the authorities. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it, this and Happy, though, both, they do a really good job of, like, there's seriousness to it, and there's funny. Yeah. And the like both are are authentic and both are real and both are treated with respect i guess like yeah. it's easy to get a dark comedy where either the serious part of it or the comedic part of it get less attention or get less you know they're like less real and in this sense in, in this movie it it did both which to me suggests a level of smart in the writing and the directing. Like, that yeah. just, like, you can't do that without having the kind of brain that can hold two things at the same time, you know? Which, of course, then leaves us to be able to feel very smart because we can also hold two things at the same Indeed. time. Indeed. No. But I like, I like that you said it, it, it has respect for both the uh, somber tone and the comedy. That's clever. Yeah. You must be smart and can hold many things in your head at once. Absolutely. I also liked the complexity of it. Like, the the different relationships that she has, even briefly, with all of these different uh-huh. characters that come along. Especially with Josh. And especially with, I never got his actual name because 
uh, any time his name was said, my brain just screamed, Nandor! <laughs> Nandor, the uh, mountain climbing teacher. Yes. Both of those relationships in particular were so nuanced in her hatred of them, but also her understanding that maybe her hatred wasn't appropriate. Yeah. Oh, and, and like her, her schizophrenic voices were kind of based on that. Like she was commanding herself to do this, but fighting against it because like she Right. She could. She knew she shouldn't. Yeah, she shouldn't be doing but this. She wanted to. Yeah. Is, it, is that id versus ego? That's some kind of thing. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay. Go back and just say that like you're saying it without a question. Well, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. No, it doesn't matter. You just do it. And then people are like, oh, look how smart you well, are. Well, it's similar to the concept of id versus ego in. Uh, Morality tales. <laughs> just, <laughs> yes, exactly. I just wanted more big words in there. <laughs> yes, I, I do think there is an aspect of that. That's good. That's I like that. Okay, so super spoilers for the end. So she has her baby mm-hmm. via C-section, yep. which allows the doctor slash nurse slash medical professional, <laughs> I don't know who that lady was actually, to talk about, you know, how plans change and, you know, we just move forward. And she says, when it's life or death, we have to make that cut, which felt a little <laughs> on the nose. But the nurse did that a lot. Yeah. But it was, it, you know, it was that like moment where the mother realizes, oh, so maybe, maybe it wasn't such a, like, maybe they were in that position because suddenly she has been in that position where she's had to make a you know split second decision and you kind of see her go through this realization that the baby is just a normal baby she's not hearing the Mm -hmm. baby voice anymore and you know you see her wondering like oh what have i done yeah and she goes to the cliff and i one thousand percent felt like she was going to she had realized what she had done she realized her baby was going to be taken away from her like all of these truths were collapsing mm. in on her and she was going to join her husband at the bottom of the cliff right yeah and that is not what happened that's not what happened you're right and i was that good was that how it was supposed to end are you glad that it ended the way it ended boy i don't know when she went out there to the cliff i'm like I wasn't sure what was going to... I mean, it was crazy. She just abandoned her baby at that point, which is interesting because earlier in the movie, she said she would give up the baby to have her husband back, which not an option, but... Right. You know, it was an interesting thing, not what you normally hear from expected mothers. Right. And... Which, again, I think is falsehoods told to us by, you know, idealized stories. I think there are lots of women in her position who would have that struggle. Like they might not so easily say it, but they would Yeah. They would have thought those well, thoughts. And she was very traumatized mm-hmm. and having a lot of mental difficulties. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I it seemed like she was gonna jump just because she was at a cliff. And then we got Nandor. Okay, was was I hallucinating or did she Picture her husband there for a while. Yeah, it was okay. her husband first. Okay. And then suddenly we realize it's actually the instructor, and she does her furies pose with her <laughs> arms up in the air, and that's cut. End of movie. Yeah. I mean, the whole time she was coming towards him, I'm like, oh, she's going to push him off the cliff, which we I fully assume is what happened, but we'd never see it. That's funny, because I don't know why, because thinking back, like, that, that's the reasonable assumption, but... I still, I was like, oh, now he's going to be traumatized because she's going to throw herself off the cliff while he's think watching. Yeah. Like, he's not going to be able to stop her or whatever. Yeah, I mean, the only other theory I had wasn't that, was that they were, you know, she's now over this because the baby is out and she's cool with it now. And so she's like going to make friends with this guy and resolve it and be like, okay. And that's what he was expecting. He was like, oh, hey, it's you. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah, I didn't understand his reaction because she had been straight up wild and crazy the whole time, every interaction they had. They bonded at the Halloween party. party. It was like he was trying to make her, I don't know. Yeah. See his side. I don't know. Yeah, so maybe he thought that he had gotten through to her. She set him straight on that. Yeah, she did. 
What did he think he was accomplishing at the party when he told her that he had talked with her husband or boyfriend or whoever it was, and that he knew that that guy was planning on leaving her? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, why? Why would you say that? That was not helpful, but I... He definitely did not think she was trying to kill him. He, she had a knife, but he was like, oh, you're freaking out. Let me help you. Like, he he was not trying to defend himself from being murdered. He was, like, trying to calm somebody yeah. down who was, I don't feel like that would calm somebody down, so I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I mean, it was just another example of men in this movie who said very selfish self-centered they were only thinking about what was going on in their own brains kind of things yeah and i thought that was interesting too because he he clearly like the other two were dirt bags yeah and they were like intentionally like gaslighting her and you know lying and being creepy and setting her up for they were going to do bad things to her i didn't feel bad that those guys Got done. But he was kind of shown as a decent guy. Not as good as Josh. Josh is Josh was an authentically good guy. (laughs) Like, he actually was thinking outside of his own brain. But Nandor was, you know, not a terrible person. But even he was very wrapped up in his own situation. He couldn't see what was going on right in front of him. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. She listens to a pregnancy meditation tape to try to calm the fetus down as it's demanding that she go kill somebody. And in that meditation, the voice tells her to imagine everyone she's ever met in a circle around her trying to put their hands on her (laughs) belly. And Uh I have never been pregnant, but that sounds like every pregnant woman's nightmare. It doesn't sound good. (laughs) It certainly doesn't seem like it would be something that would calm people down. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, that might have even... They might have created that tape for the movie as kind of a joke of like hippie, you yeah. know, nonsense. Like that's really upsetting. Yeah, uh, the nurse slash doctor slash whatever NHS yeah. professional definitely had that vibe to her. Like she yes. just said all the things that people say that don't mean anything or that are just straight up unhelpful. This was one movie that I knew why MovieBot had it, because I had heard what it was about, and I was like, well, that's an interesting idea, let's see that. But I kept putting it off for over the past year or two, because I'm like, oh, it's not going to be very interesting, you know, it's going to be dumb. And I find that I did enjoy it quite a bit. It wasn't my favorite movie, but it was pretty good. And it was very well acted, it looked good, it was well done, and surprising and funny bits. So those are all things I like. So I think that I would like to rate this movie. I'm going to go all the way to four anchovies out of five. And that might be a bit of a stretch, but three and a half is not quite there. I hear you. I am surprised to find myself in this moment realizing that gaping plot holes (laughs) Mm -hmm. and a premise that's not like not at all what it says it is are less problematic to me than many of the things we have experienced understand this month so far like it really like there are some serious issues with the plot of this movie and everything else about it is so well done and the acting and the timing and the nuance of it mm-hmm. is so clever that I can acknowledge that all of those problems exist and still agree with you in giving it four anchovies out of five. I enjoyed watching it. I think other people would enjoy watching it. It was smart. And I I truly think anybody who has like that dark, morbid sense of humor would get something out of this movie if they can set aside the plot holes. So yeah, yeah, one of my favorites so far this month. Cool. Yeah, I'm surprised that a movie about just stabbing people worked this month well for me, because that <laughs> right? is not my forte. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot about this that I I, I don't know why it worked, <laughs> but it did. Speaking of movies about stabbing people and not working, which is the opposite of what we were speaking of. <laughs> yes. It's time for the Evil Twins. 
to this movie, <gasps> Revenge from 2017. So, Prevenge, Revenge, I think I see how you decided on your uh, evil twin here. Weirdly, it's our second Belgian movie of the month. That's, that is weird. Yeah, you wouldn't expect. Um, there's like a hundred movies called Revenge out there. I ended up watching the first several minutes of a different movie before realizing it wasn't this one. So um, I would point out how you can find this specific one, but I'm not going to point that out. You don't need to know that. It's not worth it. <laughs> this is the story of a woman who uh, joins her boyfriend on his hunting trip. Like, just she's not going on the hunting trip because she's just a girl. And also, it's her married boyfriend. Well, yes, that's part of it. And she ends up getting raped by one of his hunting buddies. And then they throw her off a cliff because that's what you do next. And somehow she survives that and wants to come back and get revenge. Not prevenge, though. No. Somehow she survives that is an interesting way to phrase what happened. Yes. Because she lands, it's a 50 foot cliff. She lands on a tree. The fact that this woman is still alive and fighting at the end of that scene, much less at the end of this movie, is too far. It, 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 yes, it, it stretches is. It stretches one's ability to set reality aside much too far. I think on a tree is not the right term. She lands impaled on a tree. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. But yeah, yeah I, those words didn't quite... Like, she's, she, she lands with a tree in her. Oh, and you know, speaking of plausibility, the old saying that if you lose more than 52 pints of blood, you're at some <laughs> risk of death. Yes. She wasn't even woozy. <laughs> her and every one of the guys she tried to kill, like, just gallons all over the place. I was amused when you read something from, I don't know, somewhere on the internet that talked about how they kept running out of fake blood. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes perfect sense. Because I'm like, that didn't clue them in. <laughs> I know. You think, we know exactly how much we need. There are four characters in this movie. <laughs> but no, nope, they ran out. So, the, here's my review of this movie. Yes. That's not how bleeding works. That's not how cauterizing works. That's not how glass works. That's not how healing works. That's not how gravity works. That's not how floating in water works. That's not how <laughs> surgery works. That's not how thirst works. That's not how ink works. That's not how <laughs> fire works. That's not how gasoline works. That's not how pe peyote works. That's not how dreams work. That's not how human spines work. That's not how feet work. That's not how drowning works. That's not how any of this That's works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> and it was unwatchable because that comprises the entire film. None of it is how it works. Yeah. Uh, that That is the perfect review of this movie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and none of it was done in a smart, clever way that makes you go... Oh, poo-poo, that's fine. This was yeah. still good. It just wasn't good. Well, okay. I think what they were doing, this movie looks like a comic book movie. And I don't know if it's based on a comic book or not, mm, but it mm -hmm. it's very stylish and colorful mm. and- Stylized. Stylized. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like it's a comic book. And maybe that was the thing is like, oh, this is comic booky. But if, you, if it's going to be real people- you can't not have reality happening unless it's, you know, like a goofy comedy or something. Mm -hmm. It just was impossible to, like, you can't follow a story that consists of rules that don't exist in our universe. Am I remembering correctly in thinking that you said this was written and directed by a woman? Yes, it was. So, surprisingly. Again, I was very shocked to hear that. Much like I was shocked to find out that Ginger Snaps had something to do with a woman, <laughs> anything to do with a woman. This one is straight up male gaze. Like, extreme. Uh, but this was my theory on that was that the first like quarter of the movie is like a Cinemax late night film. Like, it's that's the male gaze portion of the movie. And the rest, I get what you're saying. Actually, still, it's I was going to I gazy. was going to contradict that and say it's not, but it it totally is. I mean, it's the it's the idea, you know, people will say, 
oh, but look, it's this badass female character, yes. and she kills everybody, and she gets her revenge, and it's an empowerment story. And I'm like, but she's in her underwear the whole time. The whole time, yes. Like, that's... That's not, that's not. It's like the Lara Croft thing. Like, Lara Croft is such a, you know, female, a strong female protagonist. Then why is she half naked? Like, yeah. people don't do her job dressed like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And this woman had more clothes on when she went over the cliff. Like, why did she well, strip down? Well, I mean, down? that's what they always do. Well, she had to rip her shirt to get the giant spear of wood out of her did body. Did she? That's, or is that what men wanted her to do? That's how they do these things. Yeah. So the whole thing, even though it, it was presented as this like female empowerment story, this yes. thing, it really, when you take it apart, is just one more woman put in danger in order to start a plot that is entirely driven by what men think would happen, what men hope would happen. Yeah, or apparently not because it was written by a woman. But. <laughs> okay, but here's that's the thing. In our society, that male gaze, quote unquote, is so pervasive yeah. that it's hard. Like most women don't even recognize it until they have practice spotting yeah, it. Yeah, th this was so extreme in the beginning. It was mm -hmm. like Girl House. Same thing. At one point, you said, like, <laughs> you turned and you said, 50% of this movie so far has been shots of her butt. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. Like, yeah. I. I I don't, even Girl House wasn't like that. Yeah. It was crazy. The movie fetishized this per specific woman, although she's the only woman in the movie, so maybe it was all women. I don't know. But it was so weird. And what it made me think about is I watched like a, you know, best horror movies around or whatever list on YouTube. And then, you know, my YouTube recommendations would keep popping up these videos about lists of horror movies, mm -hmm. which is great because I'm always happy to see those. And what I suddenly noticed was, you know, when there's like four of them in a row in my recommendations, every single one of them, the image for it was some woman screaming in agony in one way or another. Covered with blood and not a lot of clothes. Covered with blood or maybe a bag over her head or whatever. And I'm like, wow, that's... Yeah, that is the thing. And that's what I was seeing in this movie was like, you know, it's supposed to be empowering that she's coming back and getting these guys. But really, the entire movie is basically her being tortured mm -hmm. by the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's her suffering that we're watching, even though she is the winner. I mean, I hope that's not a spoiler. This is a movie called Revenge. You figure it out. Also, we're not <laughs> going to suggest that you should actually watch it. So. No, you should mm. not. So, I mean, it's it's all about s the fetishizing the suffering of women, which yes. is crazy. Which, unfortunately, is something that happens in a lot of horror movies. Mm -hmm. Many of the subgenres of yes. horror are focused on that. And even outside those specific subgenres, that is often the situation. You know, there's a reason why we're always joking about the very concrete stereotypes in those, like, group yeah. of teenagers movies and stuff it's always that is always an element of it and you know fortunately i'm starting to see some changes in that sense like yeah. there are movies coming out that are not based on that and are and don't rely on that but they are few and far between and i mean i guess you have to look for them you have to be aware <laughs> and like you have to revenge. notice, right. You have to notice that these things are happening and, and I don't know. So um, what would you rate revenge then? Giving it big props for the quality of it, the uh, acting and cinematography. It was very stylized. It was very stylized <laughs> and they had a great setting. Like they were out uh -huh. in the middle of nowhere in some desert place. Yeah. And it was harsh and scary. All that's wonderful, so I'm going to give it a bunch of bonus points for that and give this movie one star earring out of five. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is not a horror movie at all. It's just action, thriller, revenge movie. That's what that is. I'm trying to decide if this movie falls into my absolutely not, I do not <laughs> reward these kinds of movies with points category. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give this movie half half a star earring because 
usually when I do the zero points, like there, there are no redeeming qualities to it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. And I think that the intention was there. I think someone wrote this story trying to (laughs) write an empowered female story. Yeah, maybe. Because I've been there. I look back on some of the things that I've written now with the new perspectives that I have after the things I've learned over the last, like, say, 10 years. I look back at things I wrote, and there are definitely stories that I look at now and I'm like, ooh, no, don't don't let yeah. anyone see that. That's That's not okay. That story is entirely you trying to write something empowering – but being so steeped in a culture of non-empowerment that you didn't even recognize what you were doing. And so I, I, I'm going to give half a point because I do think there was intention there, That's, but it completely yeah. failed. And I really, really hope that whoever was behind the creation of this story <laughs> is able to expand their their horizons to recognize why it failed. That being said... I suspect that a lot of the people who watch this movie do not look at it from a perspective of actual, like, modern no, feminism in any way. All. And that they will think this movie was really well done, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, because it's got that artistic look to it. Yeah. But when you when you strip that away, this story is not great. Luckily, our next film, Fingers Crossed, is going to finally be the first time a ghost appears <gasps> for us Ooh. because the movie is called Cadaver from 2020. Ooh, there's definitely ghost potential there. I mean, let's hope. Yeah. At the very and- least, this cadaver is probably going to move because otherwise, not much of a story. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> don't put a cadaver in Act 1 <laughs> if you don't intend to shoot someone with it in Act 3. Yes. And as its evil twin... You're going to be a little surprised by this one. Its evil twin is something called The Possession of Hannah Grace from 2018. Weird, huh? I am not seeing the connection. Until you realize that The Possession of Hannah Grace is also known as Cadaver. That's an alternate title for it. So you went like deep cut. Well, the trick is uh, on some of these search services, when you search for a word, it'll actually find movies based on the alternate title automatically. And so that came up and I'm like, what are you talking about? Clicked on it and it said, also known as cadaver. So boom, cadaver times two. All right. I like it. We're not making anything too obvious. No, we're very subtle and artistic about our art. All right. Well, it's long past time for me to give my kittens snackies. Yeah, we should get on that. I'll be back tomorrow. Okay. See you then. (gasps) Are you ready for snackies? Should we go get snackies? She listens to a predita- predation. There's another. Let's make a movie with that word. <laughs> I don't know what it means. Predatory but- meditation. <laughs> I don't even. Uh, how would that work? <laughs>